So, Steve. Um, for those of you that would like to hear, what Steve is going to talk to you now a little bit about the global uh, research outcomes that we are hoping to achieve um, in the coming years and what we want to do about that. Uh, Steve, as you know, uh, is a, uh, a neuroscientist and has an educational neuroscientist, worked uh, in, um, with children for many, many years, became very interested in Montessori through his own daughter, began to explore it, <coughs> And as a consequence of all of that, has been helping us over the years to think more objectively about the necessity for actual measurements that we are going to be able to use that actually explain our case rather than uh, measure it to the norms of standardized testing and so on. So thank you, Steve, very much. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, we have to hear more from Gabriel. And I don't, uh, I don't often say this, but um, my God, what a tough act to follow. So thank you, sir. I was reflecting earlier when I was, uh, when I, I've gotten to know Phil a little bit these last couple of days. We've met once or twice before. And uh, I was reflecting, uh, it was 11 years ago that I first uh, came to this meeting and uh, Mungo Shaughnessy organized for me to come and do the keynote in 2007, which uh, was quite flattering. And, and she explained what she wanted me to do, come to Amsterdam, stay in a hotel here, and speak to AMI. I don't really think I grasped the scope of that then. And I said, that sounds great. And Molly says to me then, oh, oh how, much, how much will you cost? And I said, you're going to fly me to Amsterdam, put me up in a hotel? that let me speak to an international monastery audience, you don't need to pay me a thing. <laughs> and, and that's right, she didn't need to pay me anything because it was such a privilege to do that. Although now, for the record, if I come back again and do that, <laughs> um, we can discuss my fees at a, at a later time. So also, the reason I'm thinking about executive functions and, get, and how it's been nice to get to know Phil is that in that speech in 2007, I asked the audience, as I introduced the concept of executive functions in my talk. I said, who here in the audience has heard that term, executive functioning? And I would say maybe 10% raised their hands. And uh, just out of curiosity, who in the audience here today has heard the term executive functioning and knows something about that? <laughs> yeah. I made a gamble. I, I, I said something that I had no expectation of being correct. I said to the audience, in about five to seven years, you'll be hearing more and more about this as its true importance in education and its value as an education outcome becomes more widely understood. And uh, every once in a while, you say something like that, and it ends up to be correct, because over the following years, I asked that question many times to audiences all over the world. And in those years, the number of people who raise their hands has been getting higher and higher and higher. And particularly in the United States, I'm finding that almost everyone has heard the term executive functioning. And when I talk about things like the importance of education as a potential outcome, or rather of executive functions as an outcome in education, more and more people nod their head in the audience. Now, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's anomalous. I think that every country in the world that has started down the path, the path that leads to the destruction of their publicly funded education system by through teaching to the test. Oh, we don't have a problem there. Every country in the world that is heading down the path of destruction for their education system by chasing test scores will find out the same thing in time, that they have gone down a blind alley. And by chasing the narrow outcome of academic testing, they eliminate and really destroy the developmental quality of their education systems. And I believe that the next place they go after that because they won't abandon assessment. They won't abandon putting the locus of evaluation in the child. But because executive functions are measurable and they're understood, and the groundswell of understanding about their critical importance as an educational outcome, my next bet is that after they realize that they really wrecked things by chasing academic testing, I'm now going to predict to you that they're going to start chasing executive functioning. And I don't think that will be as destructive a process. However, we in Montessori run the risk of them lodging on something 
that is a little bit better at provoking EF outcomes than the conventional path and staying there because it was better, <laughs> okay? So what we have to do, and we got no time to waste, is we have to be so clear that as countries start turning to other measures, that they know that the one they're going to go to first, this is my prediction this year, they go first to executive functioning. And that drives their education policy. We need to get there and be ahead of that. So when they say, how can we boost these executive... Oh, well, here's the Montessori people. In Brazil, let's say, when that turn happens, they say, you in Brazil, Gabriel will say, well, as it happens, we've got seven years of data on executive functioning in Montessori schools. And uh, as that turn is happening in the United States, there was a need for a publisher to produce a reliable, accurate measure of executive functioning so we could use that in our schooling as a way, as something to, something to look after, to look, to look toward, and, and Real Function Sciences has, has met that need in anticipation, but no, really, as the wave is cresting and now the attention shifts. That will happen everywhere. It cannot not happen because there is only one place that a country's education system goes when they chase narrow academic outcomes, and that is down, okay? And it takes, I think, between 15 and 20 years. I mean, seriously, who's here from America? Can you find an audience this size? This is not a full room, but can you find an audience this size where anybody thinks more academic testing is the way forward? Anybody who's not in some way in the academic testing game? You can't, because it's all clear, and it's embodied in law. And no politician is going to come out as the anti-education senator by saying they're against accountability in, in, academic, in, in, accountability in school evaluation. So I want to lay that on you, and, and uh, I wanted to suggest that we have little time to waste. We need to get out ahead of this wave that will crest in different years in different countries, because every country goes down that path at a different point. Lynn said to me years ago, oh, it's astonishing, it's appalling. Countries just copy other countries. And they copy, you know, here we have our, our UN representative saying, yes, that's right, countries copy other countries. Everybody's copying the education policies of those who went down this dreadful path first, okay? And uh, now, Laura Flores, Shaw and I have just finished a, a speaking tour through Europe where half the whole content of that, of that lecture is, hey guys, it's not just your country. Because I swear to you, every place that we've been in the past two weeks, everybody's talking about school testing. And we're hearing about how it, um, how it makes it difficult to do Montessori well and how it causes stress for children. And it, it, everywhere we go in the world, it's going to be the same conversation, except for like Finland and maybe Thailand, who seem to be sensible about these things. So we want to get out ahead. We want to surf just ahead of that wave so that we're there. We're ready for it when they say, what else can we do? How about EFs? And we'll say, well, yeah, yeah, we do that. We've been doing that. Here's our, here's our data, <laughs> you know? And it's got to be global. Uh, it's got to be large, it's got to be big, and it's got to be persuasive. And that's what I want to talk about today, having burned a little bit of time in my intro. Um, and I'm going to get there by beginning by talking about the business that we are all in as educators or as people in this field. We're in the child outcome business. And um, how, child, how a, child, their <laughs> a child's outcome is manifest as a product of Nature via nurture, you've all heard that. The nature versus nurture, no, that's over. It's nature via nurture. And by nurture, we mean environmental factors. Now, that can even be in utero, but for purposes of today, let's say things that happen to you after birth. Now, environment means home environment and non-home environment. Okay. Well, we're, we, we, we can, and we often do, influence home environment through um, inviting and engaging parents and understanding the developmental processes that their children are, are undergoing. But to be fair, most of our impact is in the non-home environment part. And, and actually, it's part of the non-home environment that we have our influence. Now, it's worth pausing for a moment to consider the sheer mass of water that education is asked to carry, really, around the world. Education is asked to compensate for inadequate home environments, for really to catch up, to, to help children catch up with everything else that's not working in their life including, well, some aspects of nature. I mean, as a pediatric neuropsychologist, I see children who got a really bad, you know, got a really bad break 
prior to their birth, right? Sometimes genetic anomalies and things like that. So school is asked to also help them compensate for what they got, uh, what, they, what fell on, on them. School is asked to do a lot. And in education research, it's abundantly clear just how little school really can do. I mean, regardless of how powerful your intervention, what happens at school is almost universally dwarfed by really family of origin related factors, principally around income and poverty and things like that, perhaps with some exceptions. Well, let's talk about school. What happens at school, the, the impact of school, depends upon, well, teacher qualities, the qualities of the classroom, like what kind of, you know, what is going on in the classroom, and of course, uh, how long they're gonna be in school. You, know, you might have the world's most magnificent learning environment, but if you spend one year out of, let's say, 12 or more years that you're gonna be educated, that one year might have been great, but it might not have had the kind of impact that, say, eight years would have had. Okay, so let's break this down. Let's talk about teachers. Teachers, well, what the experience the teacher provides is a function of their training, what they know, what does the teacher know? Okay, they know different things. But there's also, of course, intrinsic teacher factors, which is an area that I am, I, I'm developing a, a great interest in. What are the qualities? You know, what are the intrinsic qualities of an extraordinary Montessori teacher? Now, the classroom, well, of course, the teacher creates the classroom. But there's another factor that we don't always consider that impacts the classroom, and that is education policy. What is permitted? You know, one of, the, <laughs> one of the most startling features of a Montessori classroom for many of parents is like the real metal sharp knife that's in the environment. Well, if you can have one. Yeah, you have one if you can have it. For that matter, what's in the environment is, is a, a range of children, uh, mixed ages, if you're <coughs> permitted to have mixed ages in your classroom. Now, how long a child spends at a school depends upon whether the school is working for them, and that too depends on policy. Can we provide uh, age three and four as part of a three, four, five, six program? Can we provide those earliest years in a, for example, state-funded Montessori primary environment? The school experience itself comes back to the teacher, comes back to conditions in the classroom. And furthermore, when we talk about uh, policy, that maybe has the largest impact in a country or in a region on what is possible. And that is a function of a political process. Uh, why is it that some, in some areas, in, some, in America, I'll, I'll say school districts, why is it that some classrooms get to have a mixed age environment? And why do some not be able to do that? And then finally, um, and what impacts that political process? Well, who influences a politician? Who influences a policymaker? Well, you know the answer if you're from America. <laughs> but more broadly, what influences a politician is an organization or organizations. Uh, those who wish to influence policy are active in attempting to influence policy. Not necessarily always negatively, but the fact is there are interest groups that are trying to affect policy through a political process. And of course, something else that impacts policy is information. Now, information that could very well take the form of information about executive functioning outcomes for Montessori students. So when we do this kind of research, we get, actually, we can, we can, do, we can get payoffs in, in three essential areas. One is uh, we can learn something about how well we're doing our practice, and, and uh, we can highlight what makes for good practice. We can um, influence policy if we can, if we can provide organizations with systematic information that helps them guide politicians in making their decisions. And, you know, really, we need all three of these pieces. We need all three of these pieces. They all are going to interact with each other. And for us to, um, you know, to really advance Montessori, uh, there's an interdependency between these things. So that means we have to gather information. We have to provide evidence to make our case that when you guys are ready to give up on the teaching to the test business, <laughs> or even if you're not ready to do that yet, here's an alternative. I think our way forward is to be is to not attempt to replace the existing structure of conventional education, but to make an assertion and, and get an adjacent place as an entirely legitimate way to do school. That's not the same way, but really, who, where is it? I mean, this is almost a human rights issue. Why should every child be submitted to the same educational process? There's diversity of humanity. Well, how about diversity of educational experience? The only reason there's not is because of what's mandated. What's mandated can be changed through a political process. 
So we get the information we need to help make that case. To be fair, it's not just information, but because we're the other guys trying to make our case, it's incumbent upon us. They demand, they require us to have this information. What kind of information? Well, we can talk about different levels of evidence, assertion. Montessori is the best. Anecdote. Well, Montessori was great for my child. Uh, okay, well, let's get, a little more, uh, let's get a little more meaningful. We can compile anecdotes. We asked these 500 parents what they thought, and now we have information about how that was the best thing for their child. Or we could do um, interviews, and we could look at key themes that emerge. Everybody says their child became a better citizen, you know, a better human being. So we can compile anecdotes, or we can do summary statistics. We can kind of track outcomes, and many schools do that. They, they do track how, how well their children do on, for example, college entrance examinations, or in public schools, of course, they, they track how well they do on the, on the mandated testing. Now, we've heard from Angeline Lillard, who has done um, two randomized controlled trials, and the exciting news is that the Brady Foundation has funded a massive expansion of randomized control trials. Because that involves true experimental design, that is a very high level of evidence. Uh, when we replicate it, it gets even better, because now we have, well, you know, it can happen. That <laughs> the RCT, the result was a fluke. We, we repeat it. And, uh, well, uh, maybe it wasn't a fluke, right? You know, we, we gambled twice and we got the same answer. There's even a higher level of evidence, which would be a hostile randomized controlled trial, where somebody says, I don't believe you, I'm going to do it myself, and they come up with the same outcome. That, that's rare, that's probably not going to happen, at least not happen anytime soon. That's good, but that's even better, but we're AMI. And I guess you all agree that one of the things we can't do is randomly assign children seeking Montessori education to a... Montessori school versus say no, no one gets to let you into their school, you know? We can't do that, right? And of course, most of our schools, we can't ask them to do that, nor would we want them to do that. It's inappropriate and arguably unethical. So at what level of evidence can we gather our information? And I think the answer is here, this we can do. This isn't nothing, and actually, the way we do that can actually be something. Okay, this isn't nothing, and the way we do it can be something. But let's be clear, this is not the... If we're going to use summary statistics with, an, with a, uh, a non-randomized design, we're not answering the question, is Montessori better than conventional? We're not answering that question. You need a randomized control trial to really answer that question. But I think that we can provide information that, is, that will let other people, if they choose to, infer that, or will certainly advance our work. So the working title for this project, and this is now the second AGM where I've, where I've talked about it. I get a little more time today. Um, but to begin, we started calling this the Closing the Gap, Montessori Outcomes Across Language, Region, Culture, and Need. Because now I think you see the shape developing, right? Summary statistics across language, region, culture, and need. Uh, so what we're saying is, oh, how is it with people from different countries, different cultures, different languages? How are, how are the outcomes across economic level? And that is how I think we can say something that's meaningful. So we're calling it now the Montessori, uh, well, the Montessori Global Outcomes pro Project, really. And that's what it's going to be. And uh, that's how we're going to roll it out. And fundamentally, this is the design. And I don't think we're going to like broadcast this design because we're going to ask people to participate who don't know what you know, but are doing Montessori and God love them, they're on our team. Maybe they don't know what you know, but they're still on our team, right? So we're probably not gonna say, what we need is a bunch of fully implemented, partly implemented, and really poorly implemented Montessori schools, which is why we're interested in your program. <laughs> probably not gonna lead with that message. But there's a lot of, a lot of different kinds of programs. And there's programs that are serving children from lots of different backgrounds. And again, let's just say high need, typical need, low need. And if we can generate enough evidence from enough of all of these kinds of programs, then we can say something that's not, is Montessori better than conventional? Because we can't do that with a randomized controlled trial. But we can say the following, which I think is an important thing to be able to say. We can say, if you do Montessori at least this well, you consistently, reliably, predictably get these kind of results regardless of the child's family background or social conditions. We, if we can say, we have a large catalog of programs that do that. If we can say, 
We see this across culture, language, region, and economic status. It is a predictable, reliable result that we see over and over and over. That is persuasive. You want to close the gap? Let me show you what we do in Montessori. You know, to be clear, if we do it this well, there's no doubt there's other ways to do this. But this is what we've found, that if we do a pretty good implementation in a Montessori environment, we reliably, predictably, consistently get these findings. And I, I think that we can generate that data. Um, but that's going to be, that's not nothing. To do this is not nothing. I'm reminded of how Andre opened up this whole event. He said, uh, he kind of talked about AMI, and AM, I think AMI's growth, and also AMI's constraints, <laughs> right? And he said, you have to do it. And I think that's how it is. I want to say we have to do it, but what I really mean is, you have to do it. You have to do it in your country, in your region, you know, in, in part at your school. But what I want to tell you is it's, it's, it's a step, but it's not a giant step, okay? And here's how I think the implementation really has to roll out. It's got to be a, a project of global scope, but with regional execution. Now, what do we mean by regional? Well, uh, it's easy to go right to country, but you know what? Probably smaller region than country, which means maybe more than one sort of hub per country, right? It's got to be doable, right? Because <laughs> this isn't the business you're in. Uh, it's also got to be useful. It's got to be worth it for you, really. Yeah, I mean, for you. It's got to be worth it for you in that afternoon, on that day, when there's too much going down, for you to say, yeah, but let's not forget, we've got to do this too. Because this too is important because it'll be useful to us. It also has to be something that helps, um, one way to think about it, it's like a signal flare we're going to shoot into the sky. We're going to generate data, accumulate data, that allows us to attract attention and interest. And I think we need to attract the attention and interest of research collaborators at universities. Now on Monday we're going to talk about two kinds of center. We're going to talk about a university-based center uh, to do Montessori studies and research. We want to, there won't be 150 of those, there won't be 500 of those, but there might be 150 of what we're describing today, regional centers for research coming out of Montessori organizations that are just doing a little bit extra to help everybody in their area get this game together. Do you understand what I'm saying? But if we can make friends with somebody at some university and say, hey, by the way, this is what we're doing. We're running this protocol. We'd be really interested if you had some ideas of your own. Because uh, we're building a research enterprise here, and we'd love to have you join in. We, we're doing this. You want to do something with us? You want to do this with us? Okay. How about your project? How about your social development thing? We, I got the schools, man. Be ashamed to miss out. If you're studying in schools, I've got here 15 Montessori schools that would love to play a part. Be interesting to see if Montessori has different outcomes for social development. I, and I can tell you why we might have different outcomes. Why don't you come by for a visit? You know, observe in our classroom for 20 minutes, and, and uh, maybe we can talk about why, what we're doing here. Well, it's not normal, right? It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. But, you know, we might have some positive social outcomes, too. It would really be, be cool if you could join in with us. I think people will say, yeah, okay, let's do that. So, again, uh, useful means worthwhile and doable for organizations. And, uh, <laughs> and because this isn't the main business that you're in, it's got to be relatively easy and cheap to implement. That means time, staff, and material costs. There are costs. It's inescapable. Um, so, yeah, this is a vision. We, we think we really can, in our Montessori world, create what the working name is a regional research center. That means um, grassroots, global, parallel, networked organization of organizations. Okay? We don't think anyone needs to create a new organization. I think we all belong to enough organizations. But I think an organization that has capacity could say, we could do this. This has been something in our strategic plan. Maybe I'm a national affiliate organization. Maybe I'm just a school that has our game together and is feeling like we want to take the next step. This is the next step for somebody, okay? And that doesn't have to be that much. To be fair, it's not nothing. But it's not a full-time employee. But it is a piece of some full-time employee. That is clear. How much of a piece, we just don't know at this stage. And that's... Um, Okay, so uh, you, you can already look at it. Augment our international protocol with local or regional tools, if you wish. But at minimum, a regional research center is going to sign a memo of understanding that says we are going to implement the AMI standard protocol. Okay, that's, that's the commitment. M-O-U, to do this protocol. 
and, uh, and not be left high and dry, but you know, to have the institutional support. We have some provisional stuff underway. We have uh, the vision for this really comes out of Molly O'Shaughnessy's work in Minnesota uh, that I've been privileged to be a part of for now <laughs> almost 11 years myself. And that, is, uh, that's a, that was our exemplar. We have um, Prague, hats off to Mirka, that Prague has taken on this role as part of another funded study, and she'll say a little bit about that on Monday. And we have people who have expressed interest in other parts of the world. Uh, Gabriel, I'm sure you've noticed that I've got a little green dot there for, uh, in Brazil. Well, um, I hope that you and your colleagues can, can play that role there. Somebody will. Protocol's dead easy. The way you do this is just not that hard. Remember, this is what Dr. Lillard showed us, a fall assessment, then spring and spring and spring. Yeah, pretty much that. That's how you do this. You start and then you follow up. And this is our protocol, and I'll talk a little bit about the measures we're gonna be incorporating into this. One is the DERS, the Developmental Environment Rating Scale. I've spoken about that in the past. Jackie Constantino has spoken about that. The, the development on that particular environmental rating system has been ongoing, and it's a mature, as we, as we knew it was gonna happen, this is a mature, incredibly useful tool for Montessorians to use for self-reflection and um, to study their own practice and to improve practice. We're gonna use the MEFs. I guess we heard something about that earlier today. We're also gonna do a teacher style questionnaire that was developed by not us, but by other people in the Montessori sphere. And we're, we're gonna, that's provisional. We're gonna see how well that works. The advantage is the DERS takes training and about 20, and an hour per classroom. So that's a time commitment, but people have an immediate payoff with the DERS. They, people who, Lynn, do you love the DERS? Yeah. Lynn loves the DERS, okay? You will love the DERS. People who learn how to do the DERS love the DERS. Uh, and now, to be, and my apologies, Phil, people who learn the mess, uh, they're interested in the mess, but they're still a little scared of it, and it's a step to do the mess, okay? That, that's a big step to integrate that, to test every child in your school. Completely doable, very easy if somebody comes from the outside to do it, but you have to pay them, right? So there's this trade-off. Uh, but again, I'm going to also give a nice demo of the MEFs on Monday. Oh, the receiving teacher survey, uh, that means that the teachers who received our children into conventional education. Okay, well, school has started. It's now, uh, let's say, November. What do you think of our kid? <laughs> you know, what do you think of our graduates? Uh, that gives them an opportunity to systematically say, these are the, we know what they say, right? So why don't we just get that systematically? We'll also do a graduate parent survey. Now, I don't have it in these slides, but this also lays the foundation for uh, developing the regional research centers means that we also have the infrastructure necessary to get really serious about the long-term outcomes work that is so essential. And I think Montessori needs a, needs a central international body to be the custodian hub and like manager of long-term <coughs> longitudinal data. That'll be like the Montessori student registry. Okay, so we get them early, we get them early on, um, and we track them until they're like 25. Uh, it'll be up to you to finish that project, Gabriel, but I hope to begin it for you, <laughs> okay? No, actually, you get to make a choice. Choice is important to us. You don't have to do that project. You understand I'm, I'm kidding him, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. It's cultural, I know, it's hard. Sometimes they seem a little dry, but try to keep up, okay? <laughs> Okay, and then uh, we do the DERS again in the winter just to keep tracking it, and then again we repeat some measures in the spring. Now the teacher style questionnaire, it's a, it's, I think it's gonna be okay, but we'll find out there. Uh, this is a poster that uh, Angela Murray, who's the research coordinator for AMS, and Carolyn Doust, who's a now retired um, Montessori trainer within the AMS sphere, who happens to be AMI trained, and, and she's a friend of mine. She's a lovely person. These are good people doing, I think, pretty good work and they're developing the scale. The advantage of the, of the uh, it probably won't be called the Montessori Fidelity Scale. You know, hi teacher, I want you to fill out the Montessori Fidelity Scale. You know, it probably isn't gonna work. It'll be like Montessori teacher style, you know, neutral and, and non-offensive. And this, I extracted this from their poster, but okay, so for example, these are uh, practices experts deem critical to high fidelity Montessori. So they did, an expert, they did expert contribution to items, then they've done a couple of waves of tryouts with these items, and so everyone agrees, three-year mixed age, observation for planning, three-hour work period, credential lead teacher, uh, something, you know, similar things in elementary. Uh, detrimental, obviously, privileges worth held, workbooks, worksheets, materials introduced at circle time, 
Good behavior pointed out, all children attend circle. Now, uh, practices with lack of expert consensus, well, I'd be interested what your expert view on these practices, that they had a lack of consensus amongst a very diverse sample of Montessori teachers. That means some AMI, some AMS, some from other regions and, and trainings, but all, okay, so lack of expert consensus, all children attend five days, full set of materials, one lead teacher, I don't know what may combine sensorial means, but that'd be easy to find out. Uh, children decide where to work. Children decide where to work. Lack of consensus, so I don't get it. But what I do know is that uh, this, I, I would predict that um, Montessori teachers who have excellent training will answer this in a fairly predictable manner. So I don't want to go too long on this, but it's in development. It's pretty far along in development. I, I don't know that I like that they did a rash analysis for the items. I don't think the way to array the items is along sort of a difficulty continuum, but we'll find out, you know. Phil, maybe, we'll, maybe we can consult. I don't know. I don't know enough about this to say anything. So here's the DERS. You've maybe seen pictures of it. It's an app that runs on the iPad. I'll demo it on Monday, so you'll get a look at it. It covers uh, child, adult, and environment. These happen to be some of the items from environment, child size, cleanliness. You tap it, you make a rating based upon a description of what we mean when we call that a three or a two or a one. It's a lovely instrument. And uh, you've already heard about the MEFs. I'm now going to, um, just as I wrap up here, I'm going to share some results. Now that the uh, Reflection Sciences um, has got some, um, some norms based upon economic status. This got these from Stephanie a couple months ago. We have high socioeconomic status and low socioeconomic status. I know that when we talk about income in the Montessori world, it feels a little grotesque. And we, I know that we have extraordinary outcomes with children who are growing up in, in countries that would be considered developing countries. And this is, this is crude and this is gross. And the only reason we talk in terms of family economic status is that, at least in most Western countries, it's awfully predictive of the trajectory they're going to take in life. And it doesn't mean that it's obligatory that we view children in this context, but as it happens, the reason it emerges is because it's useful but it doesn't have to be something that we hold close to. So uh, children from higher economic backgrounds do better on the MEFs than children from lower economic backgrounds. I don't think that's a newsflash for anybody, given that we work in the education business. But we also can find that even a high-income sample from an excellent Montessori program, these would be some of the classrooms associated with the Marie Montessori Institute in London. You might be familiar with that institution, Lynn. Uh, they're doing better than high SES as we hope that they would, because they've got the advantage of everything that goes with income, which some good, some bad, a lot of it good for outcomes, uh, plus Montessori. Here's, a, here's a Cornerstone Montessori School, a charter in Montessori, Minnesota, that I have um, some involvement with that is at the Montessori Center of Minnesota, and that's low income, but we're doing better than, better than uh, the low income norms. Now, you know, these are not blistering differences, but they become very interesting over time, and they become interesting to, huh, to policymakers. They're just seeing the policymakers seeking to close the gap. And that's just a couple of rounds. I mean, that's not definitive yet. And here's, a, well, here's a South Carolina. You know, that's Brooks data, South Carolina, and uh, an awful high percentage of, high, relative high percentage of low-income families. Yes? Yes. Okay. And uh, that's um, from Memphis, and uh, that's from Washington, D.C., Breakthrough Montessori, which is kind of the home school for the uh, National Center for Montessori in the public sector. And, uh, there's a Milwaukee sample. Holy smokes, that is not a high SES sample in Milwaukee. But they do have their game together in their Montessori. So these are quite interesting findings. And that's one more from uh, low income from Camden. I, think it, I can't read it, but I believe it's someplace, it's someplace else. That's a relatively low income sample from someplace else. Maybe you've been there. So, OK, so this is all very interesting. Yeah, we got high income, mixed income, low income. And uh, this is where we want to be. And it, when we do this systematically, and we do it across lots of other dimensions, I don't think this can be ignored. And in fact, in part because of the sheer scale, right? That's the thing. Large numbers, scale. The mess and the DERS, uh, the beginning analysis showing, does in fact the high DERS score for the environment yield a high MEFS score? It's a very limited amount of data, but with the truncated sample, uh, the answer is yes. It predicts it not completely, which is good, because of course, there'll be other factors that will also predict it. Um, but we can run this protocol, and we can generate the data, and now, okay, now, Lynn said, be bold. Be bold. Be bold. 
okay, how does 15,000 children sound? Is that bold enough for you? And how does uh, 500 schools? And how does how many countries are represented here? Uh, uh, well, there's room for almost everyone. We want, we're aiming for 50. Uh, so line up fast. Uh, you won't want to miss out on this opportunity. Um, uh, to be fair, okay, we'll make it 58. You know, if there's demand for it. We want we do want a diversity of Montessori practice. That's how you get the if you do Montessori at least this well. And for a lot of us, in I, I always say in the high quality Montessori world, it's kind of like. Oh, okay, yeah, I get it. I want you to have that response, because we want our research to be exemplary with high-quality Montessori. Yeah, we do, but we also want to be comparative within Montessori, because that's what this is. This is a, if you do Montessori better, you get better outcomes study. And of course, diversity of backgrounds. Now, there's other things that we'll do. Uh, I, I, I hope that you really were paying attention during um, Dr. Zalazzo's talk this morning, because why EFs? Why is education converging on EFs? Well, if you wanted like a single score that could say an awful lot about the future of a child, we used to think that was like an IQ score, that we used to think that could be the determinative outcome. And to be fair, IQ correlates with everything a little bit, okay? It certainly correlates with academic outcomes. But the thing is that as, well, as we heard earlier, EFs predicts, often predicts better, okay? Often predicts better, and it's not dependent upon this thing that obviously you know, kind of reeks of privilege of birth, right? Like you got born into a lucky set of genes, you got a high IQ, the world is your oyster. That's not true if you have low executive functioning. But if you were born into the world with high executive functions, okay, the world is your oyster, quite potentially, regardless of what you're going to choose to do. University professor, uh, own your own plumbing supply business, it will probably be a really good plumbing supply business if you have uh, high executive functions. But we can go into other areas. And the thing is, the point is this. It is dead easy to administer the MEFs to a child. It's about a four and a half minute process. They, are, they find it engaging. The hard part for you is the uh, augmented organizational structure you know, for your school, for your organization, to kind of accommodate the fact that, oh yeah, we're gonna do MEFs testing this week. Oh, already, it's springtime already, back to the MEFs testing. But we have to do that. And so that's the step forward. We could. No, I want to say this. We're gonna, we, we need to build the global data collection network that will set us up for a win. It's dead easy to administer the MEFs. There's, there's, uh, there's value in using the MEFs, both for your own statistics to say, here's what we're doing, and also for, to contribute to the global outcomes, right? To contribute to the, the global work together. But we can do other things too. We can measure EFs uh, all from what, let's say, age two and a half to about age it's, it's 18, we can do that reliably, yeah, with the MEFs. But there's other things we can look at. I'm a great fan of moral development, okay? And there's a measure that I used for my dissertation many years ago called the Defining Issues Test. I'm not gonna define the Defining Issues Test for you, but in, in capsule summary, summary, it's a bunch of moral dilemmas that you can read this on your own, because I don't think I have time to read it to you, but the gist of this is, uh, you know, should Heinz steal the drug from the greedy druggist to save his ailing wife? If you were around in the 70s, you must have encountered this somewhere. And, okay, the answer is not just what's the right thing to do, but also um, why is that the right thing to do? And there are, you're offered choices about why you should do this, what's the most important reason to do it, what's the right thing? Turns out you can make a principled argument for stealing the drug or for respecting the property rights of the druggist, okay? And so how do you make that case? Uh, which is the most important, which is the second most important, which is the third most? Again, I'm not here to, to read all this to you, but the point is we can do that. But we can also measure infant and toddler general developmental outcomes using a widely available tool that's used all over the world called the Ages and Stages Questionnaires. And they're not that expensive to use, and it certainly connects us to lots and lots of other developmental research, as the MEFs connects us to lots and lots of other neuroscience and, and development research. And in fact, this is one of the things we're trying to, to, to do. We're trying to use things that other people are using, okay? okay we're, we're, we're not, we, want, we need to invent things, but we don't need to invent our own outcome measures. We want to use outcome measures invented by other people that other guys are using, so we can right next to them show what we're producing. So there's lots, of, there's five areas of motor development for the ASQ. Uh, the ones you'd expect, communication, gross and fine motor, problem solving, personal and social. There's really only so many things that fall into the categories that they tend to be able to and to want to measure in uh, the early years. You can also measure creativity. We heard about the EPOC earlier from, um, from Brooke. Well, this is some NCMPS data. 
uh, showing differences in <coughs> creativity outcomes. On day. It, holy smokes, look at the monastery benefit for creativity. Brooks saw that too. Okay, and convergent tasks, the business about chasing the test scores, yeah, there's a cost in creativity. So is it the epoch? Maybe. There's some other measures. We've been, I've been talking to um, um, a creativity researcher. Here's an example of one of his tasks. List alternate titles for the movie Titanic. It's an alternate uses type measure, okay? That's, it's, a, it's a way to do creativity assessment. Uh, list alternate titles for the play Romeo and Juliet, and kind of things like that. Alternate uses, alternate things. He's got attitudes and values. So, I mean, there's a, there's a body of researchers who do creativity. They create measures, like this one. And we can use these things and, and, and other things too. You know, we, we have the standard protocol, we have the, inf we have the machine, right? <laughs> we build the machine and then we plug things into it as we find them interesting. I think we should stick with EFs for a while uh, to build the machine because that part isn't the hard part. The machine is the hard part, right? Measuring the EFs, let's make that easy. Let's do four and a half minutes per child so we can make this statement. And that's the statement that's gonna help us come forward. And so where we are now, well, I'm not a sailor, but I know how the beginning of a regatta looks, right? Looks like this. Uh, we're on our way to this. Uh, since Nico came on board, is Nico in the room? Okay, since Nico came on board, we're a lot closer to this than we were, and we, we can begin rolling out people. So somewhere in the audience, somebody says, OMG, that's the neatest thing I've ever seen. You know, actually, I never get that. <laughs> no. But somebody wants to try this out, and I think that we're trying it out in Minnesota, in the Czech Republic. Uh, we're beginning to try these things out in London, and uh, I think we can do this. Uh, we're going to need some funding at some point to do the central management part of it, but not a lot of funding. This is a high value. This is a high payoff for low investment kind of project, uh, especially when we bring the longitudinal element into it. So that's all I have today. I know we're out of time. But uh, thanks for coming, and we'll go into all this in greater detail and other things, too, on Monday. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you all very much. Let's, let's see if we can't make some of this happen amongst ourselves. That's the thing we have to do. Just a little bit of intentionality, and a lot of things can actually end up happening. <laughs>